Can mental health issues make you more successful? Interview with Cheryl Johnson. Do you feel that having mental health issues mean you are not going to succeed in life? Think again. Our guest today has a different story to tell. Would you like to hear how having a mental health issue actually helped our guest, Cheryl Johnson, to not only survive, but made her more successful than otherwise? Then stay tuned. You're watching Happy and Healthy Mind, episode 117. And Cheryl Johnson is a retired instructional designer. She's transitioning into a role where she teaches people about history. But she herself has dealt with mental health issues as well as her family members. And she's passionate about educating people about mental health issues and volunteers her time to bring hope to people that they could also be successful by sharing her story. And I'm your host, Dr. Rosina Lakani. I help leaders stop burnout and optimize their mental wellness with precision medicine. I believe that your mind is the software that runs the hardware of your brain and your body. Therefore, we bring practical tips for mental fitness in these programs so you can live a happy and healthy life. If you find this content helpful, then join our mission of eradicating preventable suffering by liking, subscribing, and sharing so more people can live and perform at their best with hope, health, and happiness. If you need specific medical advice, please consult your healthcare professional. All right, so let's learn from our guest. Thank you, Cheryl, for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. I love the, your little analogy where we talk about, you know, your brain being the software because that implies that it's programmable. Yes. That, you know, and you can change the program and you can tweak it. You can do all kinds of things, which is really what mental health is all about. Yes, yes, definitely. We, that's that's whole the focus of treatment and training is. And in our uh, society, we spend so much time educating about the facts and figures and sometimes you forget about training our thoughts and that's what make a huge difference in people's life mental health and wellness so share tell me how did this topic become important in your life well i'll start briefly very briefly back when i was a teenager i remember being in high school and there was a count this was a long time ago there was a counselor and not an academic counselor that came to our school and she was like, well, if, if anybody, you know, needs someone to talk to, a friend, I, I don't know what you want to call it, I'm here. And I was like, that's me. <laughs> and then I remember talking to her and, you know, it helped. I didn't feel like whatever issues I was having, I knew I was, my moods were a little erratic, but that's kind of normal for a teenager. And I went on with life. And as I got a little bit older, I moved to California. I was living in Wyoming at the time and moved to California. And I was living in Central California and I was moving up to the Bay Area and I was all excited. I'd got this new job. I was everything was going great. And I drove up to the Bay Area. I pulled up to the place where I was going to stay. And the woman came out and was helping me unpack my stuff, you know, and I was bringing it in the house. And all of a sudden I just had this breakdown. Um, I just started crying. I was sobbing. And I don't cry. I'm not a crier unless I watch a dog movie where a dog dies. You know, I, I rarely cry. And I was sobbing. And so and then I packed everything up in my car and I turned around and went back to Wyoming. Huh. And even still, and this was in the days long before cell phones and all that kind of stuff. I don't even know how they got a hold of my phone number in Wyoming, but they called me and said, hey, come on. We really wanted you. Come on back. And I was like, no, I can't do it. I was in my bedroom. I didn't want to come out of my bedroom. I didn't want to go get a job. I didn't want to do anything, which is unlike me because I was somewhat of a workaholic. I started working when I was like 12 or 13 watering lawns for a, a professional company and always wanted a job, always wanted to work. And when I was young, that, that served me quite well because that helped me be successful. But I also realized as I got older, I come from a family of workaholics <laughs> and workaholics have a tendency sometimes to have anxiety and other issues that drive them to be workaholics. So it's helpful, but long story short, I'll jump from 20 to age 35. I had four kids and owned my own business and I was literally working 
what, 10, 12, 14 hours a day, seven days a week. And that's with four kids and a disabled husband. And I was, you know, four or five years went by. I was like, hey, I'm like 35 years old and I'm at the pinnacle of my success. I, you know, I don't need sleep. I don't need food. I don't need anything, right? Oh, well, that changed. <laughs> and the world came crashing down. And in those days, we call it, you know, a mental breakdown. And I had a mental breakdown, ended up getting divorced. And for two years, I was in bed. And I, be odd. yeah, and for a workaholic, I mean, I didn't have a way to care for my family. I, it was, it was a very, very difficult time, but I, I just couldn't get out of bed. And if I did, I, I, I had gone from like what I felt was superwoman to, you know, this woman who couldn't do anything. And that's what drove me to go get professional help. And um, like most people, when you go to the doctor, especially a psychiatrist, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Yeah, they ask you about your past history a little bit. But, you know, I didn't think too much about my past history. That was history. <laughs> and so I, you, you tell them what's going on in your life at the time. And so I got several diagnoses, which were inaccurate. Um, I certainly don't blame the doctors. That just seems to be part of most people's mental health journey. But eventually, after a few years, I was able to get, you know, the, the medicines that were helping me. And I also learned, I think one of the biggest things I learned was medication is just such a very small part of the overall, you know, recipe. Because yeah, <laughs> recipe for recovery. And I had to learn. I, I can't work 10, 12, 14 hours a day. That's not good. Even if I could, I... It, I couldn't do that anymore. And I also needed to eat and I needed to be careful because even prior to this breakdown, I was like really sick all the time. I mean, I caught everything that went around. And so I kind of, it was when I went to go get help for, you know, having a breakdown, I thought, oh, this is just, I'm just sick. Something is just wrong with me. And every doctor I went to was like, I ah, ran every test in the world and nothing wrong with you, nothing wrong with you. And I finally went to a holistic doctor and they actually tested, I don't even know what they tested, but whatever they tested came back with, um, I didn't, all of the good bacteria that you have in your body that actually fights illness didn't exist. And so <laughs> my prescription was to, I mean, he gave me some, you know, acidophilus type, you know, Probiotics and stuff. Yeah, probiotics. That's the word I'm looking for. And but I, I was to eat lots of yogurt every day. <laughs> and I did. And, you know, eventually I got better. And I found that in my conversations with other people who may have had, you know, a similar experience to me, they're all like, oh, I don't take medication, you know, that. And I admit the first couple of medications I went on made me feel kind of numb. You know, they took away this what I considered this drive that I had to work all the time and this creative edge that I felt like I, you know, I was, I was always doing things, you know, the creative way. I didn't like those medications and I went off of them like most people, you know, who are in those circumstances do, but eventually it was getting, I had gotten remarried and my new husband was like, you need to sleep. <laughs> you can't live like this. You need to sleep. So I finally went back to the doctor and he gave me a very, very low dose of an antipsychotic. And I was like, I, I'm not psych, I don't have psychosis. He said, trust me, it's an extremely low dose. So I said, okay. And I remember thinking, okay, it's Thanksgiving weekend. I can afford to sleep the whole weekend if I have to. I'm at my mom's house. She'll take care of the kids. My husband's there. Everything's okay. So I took, you know, the medication and I went straight to sleep. And I woke up eight hours later and I was awake. I wasn't hung over. I didn't have, I just, it was like, wow, this is amazing. I didn't know there was something out there that could make me do this. So I continued taking that medication. But over the course of about a year, I found out that it was making me a little bit on the depressed side. I was going back to these crying fits, which I'm not a crier. And so I went back to the doctor and they're like, well, here, let's put you on an, a, you know, an antidepressant. Uh, I said, okay. And the first one they put me on worked in conjunction with this other antipsychotic I was taking. 
And I've been on that combination of medications for 20 years now. And I was able to go back to work and thank goodness, because I def- definitely was in the hole financially. <laughs> and But what I found was this new recipe of medication that I was taking, whatever you want to call it, and sleeping and being much more conscious of what I was eating and exercising and a few other things allowed me to not only work and be productive at work, but I still had that creative edge. And that's worked for me in some cases. And that's kind of worked against me because I still, somebody at one point in time called me a maverick. (laughs) And I was like, oh, that sounds like a good thing. And they're like, no, that's not a good thing. And I was like, hmm. (laughs) <laughs> but for 20 years, I, I've been, I continued on with my instructional design career and I was able to pay my bills and meet my obligations and, and find a, a certain sense of satisfaction and fulfillment. But more than anything, I, I was able to have a good relationship with my, my kids and my new husband. I can tell you right now, if I hadn't have been on medication, I would not be married to this good man that I'm married to today. And it also helped me as my children went through similar issues to help them get through some of these challenges. Now, as adults, they've continued to go on their own journey. And, you know, some of them have stayed on medication, some of them haven't. And I'm not saying, I'm not here to tell anybody what you should or shouldn't do. Just because this was my journey doesn't mean it will be your journey. And I just feel like people need to, and I think that's the other thing that I really got out of this was, I learned so much about myself. And when you're running, 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 like I was, you don't take time for self-reflection. You don't take time to, you know, meditate. Meditation is another thing that I do. And it's in those quiet moments that I'm able to really figure out how to deal with the challenges that I face today. Because to be honest, I still have challenges. I still have a lot of anxiety, but it's more, and as I've gotten older, it's gotten worse, the claustrophobia kind of thing has really kicked in. I, I've always had it from the time I was a child, but it's really kicked in as I've gotten older. And as I was flying back and forth across the country pre-COVID for some jobs I was working in California, I'm currently living in Virginia. This is crazy. I know this is going to sound insane, but I got on the, the biggest airplane, the Dreamliner. And I used to be a flight attendant when I was younger too. But, you know, so I'm, I'm on this huge airplane and I'm like claustrophobic. And I'm like, this, this isn't right. That This isn't right. So I went back to my doctor and, oh, I, I guess I should mention too, one of the things, because my husband, you know, once we got out of the hole financially, he's made good money and we've had good insurance and that type of thing. And I actually went and got brain scans and that was very enlightening. Well, there was two different, two different kinds I got. Did you go to uh, Amon's clinic? Yeah, I went to Amon clinics. Amon's yeah. Clinic. And yeah. they they put those things on my head. Yeah, electrodes. And, yeah, electrodes on my head. And then I sat there in a very quiet room with very quiet music and stared at nice, calm pictures. And when I got my brain scan back, it's like the whole front of my brain was red. Uh-huh. From Even though I was in this very calm yeah. state, my brain was still racing. Right. And this, yeah. this was 10 years after I'd gotten on. So you were talking about how your life really was affected by this mental illness that showed up in in your life. And then once you started getting treatment, how much better you got. So our audience would love to hear some of the tips and tools that allowed you to get through that process. So do you have some tools for us that people can apply right away in their life? Sure. Once I got on medication and was stable, I came across, you know, an organization, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Another one was called RAP, Wellness Recovery Action Plan. There's many of them out there. And I, and I, I think they're all good, the ones I've briefly, you know, but those are the two that I volunteered with. Mm-hmm. And I would teach classes and help family members of, you know, who had loved ones with mental health issues. And I would teach their curriculum and I also, they have a what's called in your own voice program. I would go around and share my story. I worked, I volunteered, when I say worked, I volunteered for some police departments, helping them learn, mm-hmm. yeah, how to 
better deal with people who had mental health issues and you know that those kind of programs and i as much as i feel like that helped other people that was also very therapeutic for me hmm. I, how did it help you well i felt like once again i was learning more about myself because people ask you a lot of questions. People want to know, you know, especially when I'm dealing with a 20 people in a room who have a loved one who has a mental health issue. They're like, well, how did you do this? How did you, what, what did you try? What, what did you do when the medication didn't work? You know, what do I do when my loved one's behaving this way and won't listen to me? Or what if they, what if they go out and live on the street and become homeless, you know? And I can tell you right now, I didn't have answers to all of those questions by any means, but talking to them was very therapeutic and it made me think back. And it also made me think, you know, cause my kids had some pretty serious mental health challenges too. And what if they were living on the street? You know, what would I do? How would I handle that? And although I have gone to therapy in my life and I have found therapy to be successful on some level, I felt like teaching these classes was therapeutic and the wellness recovery action plan was actually writing down a plan how am i going to you know deal with this situation with that situation because just because i was on medication didn't mean that my whole life just all of a sudden magically changed and everything was fine i still had a lot of issues that i had to deal with what i say is medications or even advanced treatment like you know tms bravado things that i do they're like stepping stone if you want to pick something from high mm -hmm. above you use the stool to reach that high place mm -hmm. if the stool is not going to pick it up for you you still have to pick it up but it makes it easier for you well and i that's what i tell people it's sometimes it's like having one or two hands tied behind your back when you have a mental health issue and you don't go get you know medication now certainly i don't think medication is for everybody that's that's a personal decision that people have to make but it helped me it helped me get it leveled the playing field so that I could then you know get back to work mm -hmm. and be a good mother I hope <laughs> and be a good wife and all those things that I really wanted to be but that yeah. I was struggling so hard to be when I wasn't treated properly. You were saying that medication is not for everybody but when appropriate based on the severity of your situation mm -hmm. it's better to take it instead of just suffering and like you know like you 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 were mm -hmm. suffering when you were lying in the bed for a couple of years getting the treatment getting out helped you to be successful again mm -hmm. but what question i am getting in my mind is that you said actually mental health helped you succeed rather than prevented mm -hmm. you from succeeding and so tell, tell me a little bit more about that. Why do you think that you are more successful because of, or this has, having the mental health issue has actually made you more successful? Well, one of the things, like I said, early on, I was a workaholic. And even though I had to slow down after I took medication, getting the right medications allowed me to continue that good, strong work ethic and it allowed but it allowed me to do it in a healthy way where prior to medication i wasn't doing it in a healthy way and i was overdoing it and i was harming my body and i was also harming my family that's why i ended up I'm one of the reasons that i ended up getting divorced whereas with the medication i could be successful and i feel like i still had that workaholic mentality that didn't go away. And I think that that workaholic mentality didn't just come from my family and my upbringing, but I've been driven since the time I was a kid. I, you know, my mom was always like, you know, I, I remember at eight years old, mom, can I get a job, you know? And she's like, no, you're only eight years old. Well, can I babysit? No, you're not old enough to babysit. Oh, what can I do? Personality wise, you were kind of inclined towards that to begin with. And then getting the treatment allowed you to modulate it, balance it out. And mm -hmm. do it you also mentioned that you tried different things in addition to medication. And when I use the analogy, so what other things other than medications you think re that really help you that maybe some of the, our listeners could also benefit from? Like I said, you know, I learned a lot about nutrition uh -huh. and 
I've had to really learn how to eat properly and what foods affect me in certain ways. And I think everybody in the world could benefit from learning more about nutrition, especially in the world where we live today. If you don't have a mental health issue, it affects your moods. It affects, you know, your body's ability to perform at its best. Mm -hmm. And so I've really learned a lot about nutrition and have taken that advice to heart and changed my eating habits. And the other thing I do, I mentioned briefly, is is meditation. I find that time of self-reflection. I, I will admit, you know, meditation in its purest form is very difficult to do. And it's a skill and you have to practice it. And, you know, just about the time I think I'm getting good at it, then I don't do it, you know, for a week. And I feel like, oh, I got to start this all over again. It's hard. I, I can't, I won't say that it's easy, but it is, it brings because my brain is always in overdrive. Even today, my brain is always in overdrive. And so I can take more medication and the higher dosage, but then I lose that, I get that numb feeling. I get that, I lose my drive and I don't want to be numb and I don't want to lose my drive. So I try to use meditation to modulate and to keep my brain from being in overdrive all the time. I exercise. I'm 62. I think. And I, I still do. I still like, I've always loved to dance and dancing, just turning on music All makes right. me feel good. And then I can dance. I, you know, and so I dance, but I also do aerials and I, you know, that's a lot of strength training and that type of thing. I teach Zumba classes. I find I that. Zumba I, classes. I, I love Zumba I classes. I don't <laughs> teach it, but, and, and I kind of sometimes laugh because I'm always behind and kind of trying to figure out what more. But I love it because, you know, it gets into that. So they say when you do exercise, it produces endorphins in your body that kind of helps you feel happier and healthier. So there are many benefits of exercise. But if you're doing some exercise that is boring, you know, it's kind of hard to sustain. When you're doing yes. some exercise that is fun, that you're laughing, it kind of brings another level of benefit to it and gives you motivation to continue also. So, and that's I think you bring up a really valid point. You know, you may not be into dancing or other people might not be into dancing or Zumba or whatever. Lately, I've been, please, I'm not an artist by any means, okay? I'm not good at embroidering. But many evenings, I'll just sit and paint. or And, and the pictures I paint, the pictures I draw are terrible. They're horrible. But I keep, it's funny, I keep my little book and I look back and I'm like, wow, I've improved. I'm not good, but I've improved. And it's so relaxing and it's, you know, it's another form of therapy. So I think people need to find whatever it is that they love because my husband and my kids always laugh at me. It's like, cause I watch everything on my iPad. I don't hardly watch TV. So you think you can dance and dancing with the stars and then other things I watch, I watch true crime or something <laughs> that's kind of depressing, but still. And so I'll pick up my iPad and they're like, Oh, mom must be watching a dancing thing because she's smiling, <laughs> you know, just watching people dance makes me happy, you know? So people need to find something they really enjoy. I think I also deal a lot with, or not deal a lot, I volunteer for people in addiction and recovery programs. And I, I work with them. And, you know, a lot of our conversations are steered around, you know, that endorphin rush, the dopamine rush. And that's what they're looking for with drugs. And I'm like, I don't need drugs. I just need to dance. <laughs> You know, maybe I'm addicted to dance. I don't know. <laughs> but if I am, it's a good thing. Yeah. So it does produce those happy hormones in the in mm -hmm. your brain. And so, yeah, in, in addiction, it just kind of is produced at a, such high level and kind of crashes so much that people have the craving to use it again. Versus when you're getting it from exercise or this which i call it art therapy or art meditation those are healthier form of dopamine release mm -hmm. that does not cause the harm to you or make it make you addicted you you enjoy doing it sometimes you forget about where the time is going you can get absorbed in it but it doesn't cause you your body or your mind harm like the drugs can so it's a wonderful way of getting your dopamine up so well, let me kind of wrap up some of the things that you have said that once when you did not realize that you are overdoing things and that you have some mental health issue, you kept on not dealing with it, you ended up crashing. 
when you started taking care of it, you were able to find your balance, you were able to get back into your profession, and you were able to succeed. Not only that, you're able to create this balance. And so you're doing certain lifestyle approaches, which are, you know, research is showing the power of doing these lifestyle interventions. So we actually call lifestyle medicine now because they have such a big impact. So you talked about food, so eating better food, exercise, you talked about meditation. Is there anything else that they would like to identify that people who may be struggling with mental health should focus on so that they can be successful also in their life? Well, not really, but kind of going back to the art thing, because so many people shy away from that because they're not good at it, okay? Literally, when I first started, I, I would do stick drawing kind of things, and I would trace things, and I would do uh, very, very simple drawings. And as I got better and better, you know, like I said, I'm still not good at it. And I think we have to get past this idea that we need to be good at something. Now, I'm terrible at painting, terrible. So what I did was I went and got um, paint by number, adult paint by numbers, you know. And everybody laughs and jokes, you know, that I'm an adult and I paint by number. And I'm like, hey, I will literally sit there for like two or three hours. And it's like, I've got to stop. I have to, I have other things I need to be doing today, but it's so therapeutic. I turn on a book, I turn on music. And I just, like you said, I get lost in it. I know a lot of people will shy away from that, but rather than shy away from it, lean into it. Don't expect to be the best or good or whatever. I never show anybody my drawings, hardly. It's for you. It's for your yeah. own equipment. Mm -hmm. So that's wonderful, wonderful. Well, we are having so much fun. Uh, the time is passing, so <laughs> we need to kind of wrap up. If people want to hear more about you or talk to you, how can they reach you? You can email me at Cheryl K. Johnson, C-H-E-R-Y-L-K-J-O-H-N-S-O-N at protonmail.com and that's p-r-o-t-o-n-m-a-i-l.com and cheryl k johnson is all one word no periods or underscores or hyphens or anything thank you thank you so people who are listening if you want to connect with cheryl you can connect with her i'm also very grateful that she is sharing a gift with us today and it's called your mental health journey so can you tell us what they are going to get if they get this gift? It's just a very high level overview of if you, if you encounter someone who you think might have a mental health issue or you yourself feel like you may have a, you know, what should you do? You know, so here's a step by step guide mm -hmm. to take those steps. Well, that would be wonderful. A lot of people, you know, we know that one in five people have depression at some point in time. And so 20% uh, of the population struggles. And if we don't identify, it becomes bigger and bigger problems. So having a plan, journey, outline would really help you. So thank you for sharing. And if you guys want to get this gift, please go to our website, happyandhealthymind.com and press that button call resources and you'd be able to get all the gifts that our wonderful guest share on this program. If you'd like us to send those links via text, please text the word joyful, J-O-Y-F-U-L, to the number 38470, and we'd be happy to send those links to you. And let me ask Cheryl, do you have a take-home message for our audience today? <laughs> What's your best advice? Uh -huh. Going back to do what you love, I, I've mentioned dogs, and even at this very late stage of my life, I've had a dog and everybody's like, you should make that dog your therapy dog. I'm like, no, because that dog has more anxiety than I do. And I couldn't take it out <laughs> in public, but I just got a puppy. This is crazy. I, at this stage of my life and she's a, a border doodle and it brings me tremendous joy. And she is actually certified now to be my emotional support animal. And it makes me smile. <laughs> so so your advice to our audience is go get a dog. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if a dog makes you happy, not uh, if a dog, dog doesn't make you happy. <laughs> so but do you what makes you happy. Yes, do what makes you happy. 
Wonderful. Yeah. And so thank you so much for your time and wisdom. Let me leave our audience with one message. I always say every day is a new day, new opportunity to make different decisions. You have a choice of either suppressing whatever you are feeling and keep going, going, going until you break down or you identify, you become aware of what is happening with you. Start taking these lifestyle steps so that you can actually prevent the preventable illnesses and be the best version of yourself. And in case you are having the symptoms, seek help in timely manner. So not only you can survive, but thrive and succeed and be the best in your life. On that note, stay safe, happy and healthy. Until next time, Dr. Rosina.